Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday morning, February 24th. 2020. I hope you had a great weekend, and I appreciate you spending a little time with me to kick off your week today. And on this episode, surprise, surprise, more bad news from the central government. There's another attack on the Constitution and the Tenth Amendment being pushed out of Washington, D.C., with a renewed effort to ramp up the unconstitutional war on a plant. So I'm going to cover that today. But first of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the Tenth Amendment Center. Quick programming note, next week, Monday, I think that's March the 2nd, I will not be doing a live stream. I will probably not even have a pre-recorded show, but just a heads up on that as well. You can find all of our archives, all of the channels that we're on, our live streaming video channels, our audio-only podcast edition, the ways to follow us, the ways to support us, like our membership program, hint, hint, a little as little as two bucks a month goes a long, long way here at the TAC. Find all of that information over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path path to liberty. And before getting into the juicy news of the day, I want to say hello to everyone out in the live chat, whatever platform you happen to be on, or if you've got suggestions for another platform or another episode that I should cover, another topic, feel free to email me, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. I read all of them. I don't get to reply to everything, but I appreciate all the feedback. So over on YouTube, Funky Euth Euphemism, Essential Freedom, Tyler B., Andrew Nappy, Melody Skamen, Heather Rossi, Carrie Norris, Anna Rays. I appreciate all of you and all of your support. Dan Reed and Michael over on Facebook. MRGF78 says, sup, good to see you guys. Essential Freedom says, tyrants, without a doubt. And I apologize if I skipped over anybody, but I appreciate you all joining me here. Make sure to smash the like button and continue leaving comments, whether it's live or in the archive, because that all helps the algorithm of the platform you're on, tells it to show the program to more people. And also want to say sup over to Paige Michelle. Appreciate you being here as well. Let's get into this. First of all, just a quick note. Here's what's happening. And I will get back to this in a little bit more detail. This is from an article that we have not yet published, but hopefully by the time the show goes live, I'll have this uh, ready to go. From Mike Meharry this morning, President Trump's proposed 2021 budget, dug deep in there, Someone was able to figure this out, that they actually went out of their way to intentionally remove an existing policy that's been on the books from Congress, surprisingly enough, since around 2014 and went into effect, I believe, in 2015. An existing policy that protects state medical marijuana programs from DOJ inf interference. Basically, what they've done is they, they've banned, banned the federal government from using any money in the budget to be able to go after people in state medical. They don't totally stop doing this, but it certainly has cut back additionally. But before getting into some of the gory details of this and some of the interesting thing, just a quick trip down memory lane. Here in California, where I live, I moved here in 95, 96 from Wisconsin when I transferred colleges to USC. But back when Proposition 215, the Compassionate Use Act, this was the first medical marijuana proposal or law that ended up passing in the country. But when this was being debated, it was on the ballot in November of 96, Prop 215, Three different presidents came out here to this state to argue against it. One current one and, well, one current one at the time, and then two prior ones. And they all basically had the same argument other than the, you know, drugs are bad and drugs are evil, you know, smashing an egg, this is your brain on drugs type of thing. They all claimed supremacy clause. Look, you puny people, you stupid people in California, and this is really a message to everyone on every issue. You don't even have to be on board with weed to actually appreciate what's happening here. But they basically came here to this state to say supremacy clause. Look, if you guys do this, don't, don't. Because the Supremacy Clause says all federal law is supreme. And I should have put up a link, and maybe I can dig this out when I do the show notes, a link to an episode that I did on the Supremacy Clause explaining how this is just absurd. Really, the short version is laws made in pursuance of the Constitution are supreme. Everything else is not. And since the federal government has only been delegated, well, about 30 to 35 powers throughout the document, 17 to 18 in Article 1, Section 8, depending on how you count it, but not a lot. And as Madison put it in Federalist 45, 
The powers delegated to the con by the Constitution to the federal government were few and defined. That means there were not many of them, and they were pretty much spelled out in the Constitution. Those reserved to the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. Again, Madison's words, not mine. Numerous and indefinite. So they basically came here and said, don't do this supremacy clause. If you do it, we're going to shut you down. You're going to get mired in an inexpensive and unwinnable lawsuit. You're basically uh, going to waste your time, waste your money, and we're going to stop you anyways. But of course, here we are 25, almost 25 years later, and now 33 states, it wasn't just California, 33 states, red states and blue states. Now, Oklahoma, the reddest of the red states, Missouri, Utah, West Virginia, these are states that have all passed measures to defy Washington, D.C.'s unconstitutional prohibition on a plant to some degree. Oklahoma, surprisingly enough, their medical marijuana program, the way I looked at the ballot me measure, and I think that passed in 2018, uh, the summer of 2018, this is the broadest one in history, far broader than what passed here in California in 1996, because what happens in most states is they actually, in the law, they're basically dictating to doctors what they can and cannot do. They're basically saying, OK, we're going to allow doctors to make a recommendation. They don't do a prescription because a prescription, then it's it's basically a legalese end run around some kind of federal control. So they doctors are allowed to make a recommendation. And in basically every state where this is passed, they still tell the doctor, well, here are the things that you're allowed to do this. As if legislators in a state capital know anything about doctoring. I mean, these people are complete morons. Uh, well, I think they're not necessarily always morons. They don't know anything about medicine, clearly, or they don't know enough to be able to dictate to other people and to doctors what's good and bad for their patients. But that's, again, another story. So in most states, they dictate to the doctors. In Oklahoma, however, they just said this is a doctor-patient relationship. I'm sure there are some police state Republicans there that want to cut back on that and change that. But basically, the ballot measure said, look, this is up to the doctor and it's up to the patient. It's up. That's their relationship. We're not going to dictate to them how this is going to play out. People, if you're in Oklahoma and you see this changing since the ballot measure passed, I think it was like 65 to 35 it was easy, easy pass in the reddest of red states. If you've seen that change, please let me know whether in the comments or by an email. Anyway, so 33 states, and we're probably going to see many more in the near future. But if you back up, it wasn't like this has been easy. Oh, it's just a plant. There has been aggressive attacks on this and aggressive attacks on the 10th Amendment if you're talking about the structure of the Constitution, the structure that James Madison talked about. And those who support these types of attacks on the Constitution on this issue are going to get themselves in a lot of trouble when another party gets in power and uses that same type of precedent to attack the Constitution on other issues. For example, and I've mentioned it on this show many times, but it's been a while now, but basically the argument, it went to the Supreme Court in 2005. And the Supreme Court, of course, with the great conservative Justice Scalia, held that if you grow a plant in your backyard, you never buy or sell it, you consume it in your own home, this somehow affects interstate commerce, and the federal government can send goons in to, to basically stomp them out. And that's basically what they did to a cancer patient. Her name is Angel Rach, and that was part of the lawsuit. So this was a position that's really bad on the Constitution. It expanded on the famous Wickard versus Filburn case. There's a great article about Wickard versus Filburn, Filburn in the last couple of weeks at fee.org, Foundation for Economic Education. Again, another link that I didn't think of it as I'm just rambling here that you guys should definitely check out. Just go to fee.org and look at their latest stories, and you should be able to find that in the last couple of weeks. But anyways, so this same argument that Scalia used— for inter a broad attack or a broad federal purview over interstate commerce, which is just nonsense because there was no interstate commerce happening in regards to that case. This was the exact same argument that they cited in the Obamacare case in 2012. They're like, well, Scalia said under the Commerce Clause it was viewed like this. So what may happen one day could come back 10, 15, 20, 30 years later to expand central power another way. And I say over and over and over, never turn a blind eye, even if you don't care about the issue, even if you don't care about the product at hand or the individual at hand, never ask for more central power, because in the end, in the long run, they're going to use that 
in other ways. Well, again, this has not been an easy road. The Clinton administration, they only had a few years of this, but they started going after California almost immediately. They threatened that they would take away doctor's licenses. This was uh, published in the L.A. Times in early 97, January, maybe 5th or 6th. This was just about a month and a half after the measure passed here in California. So they threatened. They ended up not doing that. But they did run about 50 different raids around the country, heavily here in California because it was early here in California, but 50 raids around the country to try to shut this down. But yet, even though his administration was 100 percent against this, there were still seven states by the end of his term that had actually been defying Washington, D.C. And then from there, we get George Bush, who really ramped it up even further. And over his two terms, there were 200 raids in the states around the country. And of course, as I mentioned, the 2005 Gonzalez versus Rage case held in favor of the central government over people being able to make these decisions under state law. And you would think, and I thought at the time, like, oh, man, and I wasn't really that good at the time. And I'm, you know, I'm still improving to these days. But I thought, OK, well, the Supreme Court ruled against this. Of course, these 10 states, there were 10 states at the time that were, were defying Washington, D.C., these 10 states, well, they're just going to have to repeal their laws or no one's going to follow them anymore because the Supreme Court ruled on this. And I still believed at that time in 2005 that if the Supreme Court ruled on something, that's the end of it. But no, not a single state repealed their law and they expanded it even further. By the end of Bush's ter two terms, it was between 13 and 14 states. And then from there, we got Barack Obama. And a lot of people, there's a heavy propaganda in this country. A lot of people want you to believe that Obama was good on the 10th Amendment. He was a pothead, and therefore he was easy on the states when it came to medical marijuana or legalized marijuana. This is total bull crap. This is a complete lie. The left likes to tell you this story because they want you to believe that progressives have good hearts or the Democratic Party is filled with people who can be compassionate. And the right wants you to believe this story because they want you to believe that you've got a bunch of lawbreakers in the Democratic Party. So they both have their reasons to promote this. But the fact of the matter is it's absolute nonsense. In just his first four years, the Barack Obama administration spent more money on federal enforcement efforts against the 10th Amendment and against states and the people who were deciding to do things differently than the feds wanted them to. He spent more money and conducted more raids than the previous 12 years combined of Obama and Bush. I mean, of Clinton and Bush. I guess it's all the same. We could call them all Obamas, all Clintons, or all Bushes. They're all terrible when it comes to the Constitution. His administration did 270 raids in the first four years alone. Incredibly aggressive. But again, by the time his his two terms in office were done, there were 29 states defying him. And near the end of that time, in 2014, let me pull this up from Harry's article again, Congress actually did something decent. I mean, I hate to admit it because Congress is filled with a bunch of sociopathic criminals, left and right, Democrat and Republican. They're just really evil. But once in a while, I guess they get something right. Same with the Supreme Court, like with the anti-commandeering doctrine. They've been consistent holding since 1842 all the way through 2018 in five major cases that the federal government does not have the constitutional authority, and they're correct to force localities or states to help enforce federal law, whatever that may be. So anyways, in 2014, back to Mike Meharry's article, Congress placed a provision in the Consolidation, Consolidated Appropriations Act, providing that none of the funds made available to the Department of Justice may be used to prevent states from implementing their own state laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. And in another example of how the Obama administration was terrible on this, they didn't just sit back and say, well, OK, they passed this. I mean, they did start backing off because they had to, under this thing called the Cole Memo, they basically had to acknowledge that there were about two dozen states doing this. And they were like going in. They raided first. They went nuts in California. Then they went nuts. They did the biggest raid set of raids in history just before the legalization in Colorado went went into effect. They did the same in Montana. But they just didn't have the resources to be able to sustain that. They could do a series of aggressive raids in one state, one city, one major city. 
and then they have to pull out. They just don't have the cash. They don't have the the manpower, the person power to be able to do it. And they would just recognize, like, look, this is just not working. Let's just try to focus our resources elsewhere, like in states that it's illegal or people who are aggressively violating even the state law. Then we'll go after them. And Congress basically put this into an appropriations measure. Congress passed this as law as well, this type of approach. Look, if people are in the states and the states have legalized it, you can't spend any money. Stop. Stop. Because there's no way around this. This is a waste of cash. I mean, it's interesting because almost everything else they do is a total waste of cash. But maybe the PR on this is starting to get so bad that you're literally going after just peaceful people. I mean, this is what they do all the time, but hopefully this type of mentality will start to spread to other issues, to grow, pun intended, to other issues. So, But in another example of how the Obama administration just sucked on this, even after Congress passed this, they still fought it in court. They still fought it in court. And two years later, in August 2016, a federal appeals court upheld the provision by halting prosecutions of people using marijuana legally based on their state laws. So they basically, and I'm not going to just read through it because it's just kind of legalese junk. They're basically saying this section of the law prohibits the Department of Justice from spending money on enforcement actions in those particular states. And then by prosecuting, the DOJ is violating the law. I mean, pretty just straightforward. This is the type of thing that I think is just, it's just cut and dry. But the fact of the matter is, is no matter how much you try to box them in in government, they always want to try to kind of work their way through it and find a loophole and keep pushing. And that's why the ground of liberty is always gained by inches, as Thomas Jefferson told us, and that we always have to push forward for more and more in the future. But going forward on this, back to the Trump administration. He proposed, this is a short version, he's proposed ending an existing policy that protects state medical marijuana programs from Justice Department interference as part of his fiscal year 2021 budget plan released on Monday. I know a lot of people, whenever we talk about how the national debt, the budget is out of control, they just want to say, well, this is Congress. The president is just, he's helpless in this. And they'll say the same thing when it comes to Obama, to a Bush, to Trump, to whoever's next as well. We always hear the same type of just kind of inane response. But the fact of the matter is, is every single year, the president tells Congress what they want. And especially when the the president's party controls Congress, they tend to kind of go along with that. When it's divided, then there's going to be some debates. And a lot of times it ends up in like in situations like we have today, when you have a uh, Democrat run House and the Republicans... uh, (laughs) In the, in the Senate and Republicans in the White House, and the government just keeps going nuts. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then again, I would say that it doesn't matter what combo you have. The only time I ever see any type of resistance from the right really is when there's a Democrat as president, but it just ends up all being bad. I mean, whoever you're voting for this year, the end result is government is going to be bigger next year and the year after. I don't think it really, really changes in Washington, D.C. But the executive branch does push for more spending on various things. And I didn't notice this at first when we started covering the new budget proposal maybe a week or two ago. Meharry wrote about it as well. And someone pinged him as like, hey, man, look what they pulled out of this. They literally have gone out of their way to dig into existing policy and say, we don't want this here anymore. And it's a rider which has been renewed in appropriations legislation every year since 2014. This is from MarijuanaMoment.net. It stipulates that the Justice Department can't use its funds to prevent states or territories from implementing their own laws that authorize the use, etc. This isn't the first time that an administration has requested that the rider be stricken. This is an ongoing problem. The administration, the government always wants more. They want to be able to tell us that it's okay. I think whether it's Obama, Trump, or anybody else, they want to be able to say, well, we are allowing you to do this. It's not okay for the states to tell us that they're going to do something, whether we want them to or not. They don't want that precedent. And that's why I think this is so important to people who love centralized power. And I think it's so important to those of us who want to advance liberty through decentralization or advance liberty at all. So this isn't the first time that administration has done this. Trump's last two budgets also admitted the medical cannabis protection language and President Obama. So for those of you, again, who think that Obama was good, that the left is good, any better than the right on this, they're exactly the same on their hatred for the 10th Amendment 
for the states, for the people making their own choices, and for the Constitution in general. President Obama similarly asked for the policy to be removed. To be removed. In all cases, Congress has ignored these requests and renewed the protections and spending bills. It must be very popular amongst the constituents, I think, because this is a very obvious attack on average everyday people. And there are now billions of dollars being made on this. It is becoming very, very difficult to attack this entrenched industry, but yet they still want to do it. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, this is back in December. The president actually had a signing statement on the current version of what's in effect, whatever kind of spending extension that they passed in December. I don't even know what they call it. Is it omnibus? It is a budget, whatever, a spending bill. He had a signing statement. And we know Obama was horrible with signing statements and Bush was horrible with signing statements. And they're basically saying well, you may pass something, you may do this, but I'm going to do it differently anyways. And in essence, I don't want to necessarily oppose that mentality because uh, Thomas Jefferson himself told us that even if everyone else thought differently, this is a paraphrase of how he put it in a letter to Abigail Adams in response to his his view that he was not, and his actual action that he refused to basically enforce the Alien and Sedition Act, he said, look, it's his duty. When you take an oath to the Constitution, it's your duty to follow the Constitution. Now, here, this is not necessarily the case that's being made in most of these signing statements. And here's this. This is the signing statement from December 20 or so last, just basically a couple of months ago. Division B, Section 531 of the Act, provides that the Department of Justice may not use any funds made available under the Act to prevent implementation of medical marijuana laws by various states and territories. My administration will treat this provision with the consistent with the president's constitutional responsibility to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. Now, he didn't specifically said he's going to ignore this, but this is basically the message that we've heard from every president. It doesn't matter what happens in the states. That's what Bill Clinton said to California passing Prop 215. So the law that we want to enforce is still the law of the land. Doesn't matter. That's the same way that George Bush treated. That's the same way that Obama treated. And Obama had a very similar signing statement a few times as well. And this is how Trump is saying it. Look, there are two different laws. One is saying you can't, uh, you can't have legal plants. They're basically making a plant illegal. And then another law is saying, well, this is how we're going to uh, use the power of the purse to dictate how you're allowed to enforce this. But he's choosing, picking and choosing, and saying we're going to go with one and maybe not the other. And that's how I read it. And this is a, a message from Patrick Henry that I think is a great reminder. He said, no nation ever retained its liberty after the loss of the sword and the purse. So when representatives of the people, even when those representatives suck, don't have the power of the sword, which they don't, or the purse, you cannot be free. Like, we may still have some level of freedom as of now, but I think what they've established for the long run does not bode well for the future unless there are some really, really radical changes. And here's how Meharry kind of summed it up, though. He's like, look, even if Trump does decide to move forward with in this enforcement effort, it wouldn't have much practical effect. Again, they don't have the resources or the person power to be able to actually pull this off. FBI statistics show that law enforcement makes approximately 99 out of 100, 99 percent of marijuana arrests happen under state and not the federal law. So when the states say, well, we're not going to prosecute this anymore, there just is no more prosecution as a general rule. There still happen. There is some. But in a broader spectrum, there is very little that is done. Furthermore, figures indicate that it would take 40 percent of the DEA's yearly budget, 40% of their annual budget, just to investigate and raid and prosecute all the dispensaries here in Los Angeles. There's somewhere around 1,000. There might be as low as 700. It might be as high as 1,700 or so. No one really knows. There's a lot of gray market. There's some very free market activity happening here in L.A. without government permission, but it would take about 40 percent, is how we've looked at it, of their annual budget just to go after Los Angeles. And that's not counting. Oakland, San Diego, Portland, Portland, Maine, Seattle, Denver, 
and on and on, Oklahoma City and the rest. So it's very little chance the feds will be able to pull this off. Maybe trying to pull this out is a message to the base that likes centralized power. I'm not sure because they just keep pushing for this. And when I say they, it's not this president or that president. Is It is the executive branch in general, which always wants more and more power. And Mike sums it up like this. He says, regardless of the practical impact, the push to resume federal prosecution of marijuana users in states where medicinal cannabis is legal disregards the Constitution and reveals an extreme lack of respect for state sovereignty and disregard for individual liberty. Look, we are at 33 states and counting resisting, defying, and nullifying in practice and effect this unconstitutional federal prohibition on weed. And it's very possible we're going to see a number of other states. I think very likely uh, things are moving forward in Kentucky, uh, Alabama, and who knows where else. Of all the states to, to have legislation move forward, Alabama, a committee voted to pass a bill 7 to 1 recently. It's got a long way to go. And the Kentucky House also passed a pretty restrictive one, but one that will end up furthering this defiance of unconstitutional federal power over a plant. I think this is a great reminder. It's time to get this reminder once again from Samuel Adams. Let me pull this up again on the screen. I will put all these links in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Here's how Samuel Adams put it, writing as Candidus in the Boston Gazette. I cite this letter often. I should probably cite more. His early stuff was incredible. But anyway, Samuel Adams put it this way. Instead of sitting down satisfied with the efforts we have already made, which is the wish of our enemies, the necessity of the times more than ever calls for our utmost circumstance. Uh, man, I usually read this in my head rather than speak it out loud. This was going to be a great quote. I was going to just cut this out as like a 15 second piece. But anyways, the necessity of the times more than ever calls for our utmost circumspection, deliberation, fortitude, and perseverance. Look, this is this is not game over either way. And we should actually recognize that until you push it, you get all the nails in the coffin of their illegal prohibition done. It is never going to be over because no matter what the situation, no matter how popular something is, no matter how many people, no matter how many states, no matter how many cities are doing something differently, the central government and government in general will continue to try to regain control over something. And whether you like this on cannabis or not, I think it's something that should also be applied to other issues, whether it's education, the right to keep and bear arms, the environment, health care, and anything and everything in between, surveillance, asset forfeiture. This message from Samuel Adams, don't sit down and just be done with the progress that we have here, because this is not a full liberty state. And mind you, if we're talking about nullifying the drug war in totality, this is just one piece of it. There is much more that needs to be covered over time. Anyways, I hope you guys found this really interesting and educational. I want to take a look over in the live chat. <laughs> Gerard, uh, Kenyette Hay says, this game, the game ain't over till the fat guy sings. No kidding. All I care about, says Frank I, is keep Big Pharma a million miles away from weed. Certainly, my bigger interest is to keep big government away from everything, just about everything, because they're so, so dangerous. Uh, Dread Pirate says, Michigan just legalized last year, had the police scratching their heads over how to handle it. That's, to me, that's a very positive thing, because the more difficult it is for the cops to do this, the less likely they're going to do other things. Asset forfeiture, surveillance, gun confiscation. So many of the gun, if you go through, and I do this from time to time, it is really, if you want to get yourself really pissed off, just read ATF press releases. All the excuses they have to take people's uh, firearms from them, their right to self-defense, a lot of times it is tied directly into the war on drugs. This has been an excuse for bad foreign policy, bad economic policy, immoral, in, unjust things like warrantless surveillance, asset forfeiture, gun control, and the like. Gerard again says, it keeps the narrative the Bill of Rights is infringible. Yeah, yeah, just as long as they keep doing this. Nick over on Periscope asks if there's enough states for an amendment. I don't, I mean, maybe. I just don't know if they would all agree. And I don't think a centralized solution, I don't think a centralized strategy is a solution. Look, the people in the states are winning 
without waiting on the Constitution to be amended to say what it already says. On this issue, they don't have authority. And the bottom line is, uh, I think if the states, the people, the cities hold fast in their policies and continue to expand them sooner or later, and I mentioned this in a video back in 2015 as well, sooner or later, the feds are going to have to back off and decriminalize or legalize, just get out of the way in order to save face so they don't look bad. Because the narrative is they want you to believe that it's up to them. And in fact, the current president has said this specifically, says... He said in some quotes, look, I, you know, I want this to be a state's rights issue, but, you know, so far we are allowing this. And to me, that's pretty absurd to say we are allowing you to do what you've been doing, even though we've all been trying to shut you down anyway. So they aren't allowing it. They're getting their asses kicked is really uh, what happens here. And just scrolling a little further back through the chat. Like in the Patriot, Gerard, you're killing it with the comments today. Why trade one king, king 3,000 miles away for 300 kings one mile away? Yeah, they're all dangerous without a doubt. An unethical law, says Evan Wade, or is not a law at all. And Mark Solomon, why would it matter one way or the other if someone wants to engage in that behavior and it does not affect me? Why should I care? So some people still want to make plants illegal. They want to make guns illegal. They want to make raw milk illegal. They want to make all privacy illegal. So many people really just are afraid of things. And as John Adams warned us in 1776, back when he was good, he said, fear is the foundation of most governments. The only quibble I would have with that would be the use of the word most. Fear is what drives more power. So as long as you're afraid of someone consuming a plant or CBD oil or having a firearm or whatever or drinking milk right from a cow, as long as you're afraid and you're willing to give government power on that issue, someone else is going to be afraid of something else that you do and they're going to ask for government to have power over your personal choice. Anyways. I do appreciate you joining me. Again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. More importantly, I hope you learned something. It is bad news as usual coming from Washington, D.C. There's a lot of bad news in the states as well. But on this, I believe that if the states and the people hold fast, the people are going to win in the long run. Again, if you like the show, if you support us, smash that like button, subscribe, reviews on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, wherever you're listening or watching really, really helps a great deal. And if you really, really support us, and I will continue and always do this show for free. We've got over 10,000 articles, blogs, posts, videos, podcasts on our website that we make available for free. And we will continue doing that to keep spreading the word. But we do need some financial help to be able to continue expanding and growing our membership program. I see a bunch of people out there who already are members. Thank you. But our membership program, if you haven't done so yet, please consider joining us. For as little as two bucks a month, it would mean the world to me. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash members. Thanks again for joining me. I hope you have a great Monday. Again, a reminder, I will not be here next week, Monday, but I'll be back on Wednesday and Friday here on the path to liberty.